really happy to be here. I um, <clears throat> hope that what I have to say is somewhat interesting. The approach that I want to take is that um, I think often universities are good at talking about human rights and teaching about human rights, but they're not necessarily good at implementing human rights and doing human <coughs> rights within the context of the university. And um, it's something that we've been trying to do at the University of Saskatchewan for 40 years now. This is the 40th anniversary of the program of legal studies for Native people. I certainly wasn't the founder of the uh, program, but I've been involved with it since 1982. And um, so I've seen it go through some incarnations that I want to tell you about and tell you sort of the positives and the negatives about some of the things that we've done. I don't know if any of this is applicable at all to uh, what you do, but you might find it interesting to hear about what's done elsewhere. So, um, so the background of this program is that, um, first of all, there are Aboriginal people in Canada, and we'd. Um, I we're want to explain to our students yes. what. Um, we're a former um, British colony, and um, when the Europeans came to Canada, there were people already there, in spite of everything that you hear about Columbus discovering America. He wasn't uh, the first person to come to America or to come to the Western Hemisphere. There were people there for millennia. And um, so the, a lot of what happened to um, the people who were already there when Europeans came is that they died because the Europeans brought diseases and the Europeans enslaved people and so on and so on. So, but there are still Aboriginal people left. and. Um, so when we talk about the need for Aboriginal lawyers, that's who we're talking about. Um, people who are the descendants of the people who were in North America, in Canada, at the time that the Europeans came. So in 1972, when they f started thinking about creating this program, <coughs> there were only <coughs> four Aboriginal lawyers in all of Canada and there were only five Aboriginal law students in all of Canada. So Aboriginal people didn't get into law school and didn't become members of the legal profession naturally. Something had to be done to make sure that that happened. The legal profession is obviously something that's significant in society. Lots of prime ministers and politicians in Canada, people who hold um, high-ranking offices in businesses and so on are lawyers and the people who usually draft legislation and so on are lawyers. So it's an important profession for Aboriginal people to have access to and for Aboriginal people it's specifically important because there has been legislation that um, is drafted to govern the all aspects of the lives of um, Aboriginal people. So, of course, because Columbus didn't know where he ended up, Aboriginal people in Canada are called Indians, like uh, Aboriginal people in the United States are called Indians. And um, so the legislation in Canada that deals with the rights of uh, Aboriginal people, at least First Nations Aboriginal people, is the Indian Act. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> if you go to Canada, it won't apply to you. <laughs> <clears throat> so because there's legislation that deals with First Nations and because First Nations and Aboriginal people have um, suffered a lot of discrimination at the hands of the legal system, it's particularly important for them to have access to legal education. In addition to that, there's a human rights obligation to provide equal access to educational opportunity to all people in society regardless of race. And um, as I said, law schools are good at teaching human rights, but not necessarily good at doing human rights. So uh, that's why we, they have a public policy school. Exactly. And most students are here <laughs> from the public policy school. Um, so in 1973, they had the first intake of uh, the program of legal studies for Native people to try and remedy the situation of lack of Aboriginal lawyers. So um, 
We use the terminology native in the title of the program because that was what was used in 1973. Um, there's a lot of political correctness about terminology. Um, First Nations is the preferred term now to refer to what the Indian Act covers as Indian people. Um, there are Métis people in Canada who are seen as a distinct Aboriginal people, but they um, have ancestry that's both European and First Nations. And there are Inuit people who are um, Indigenous people who live in the Arctic regions of Canada. So they're sort of um, treated as the equivalent of Indians, but they're not governed by the Indian Act. So in terms of legislation, that's where they fall in. And um, so we use native in our terminology because the program that we offer is open to all Indigenous students, not just Indians, not just Métis. Um, and people have said that we should try using Aboriginal in our title, but uh, it'll change. So we're just sticking with Native right now. Um, we could use Indigenous because that's the terminology used in the uh, United Nations Declaration. So maybe we should be pull sap or pull sip, but Pluznip is a mouthful, so we'll just stick with what we've got for now. Um, so law school is a professional program in Canada. It's a, a second degree. Most students have at least one degree before they start law school. They've usually got an a undergraduate degree at least. It's competitive to be admitted to law school. Only one in 10 to 12 students is admitted. Um, the criteria for general admissions is um, grade point average and law school admission test score, so um, standardized testing. But um, law schools have recognized that um, that does create problems because of uh, disparities in opportunity. So alternative admissions are possible for mature students, disadvantaged students, and Aboriginal students. And um, it, affirmative action is constitutionally protected in Canada now. It wasn't in 1973. At that time, um, affirmative action programs were approved by the Human Rights Commission. So I don't know how that compares with um, the situation here, but that's just sort of the background that we operate in. So we've had three models of the program of legal studies for Native people. The first problem, with, the first um, approach was the law school model. When this program was first started, there was a lot of um, skepticism about the ability of Aboriginal people to be successful in law school. If they were given the opportunity, would they just be taking up a seat that could be more productively used by somebody else? And so this program was devised as a way of determining which students had the right stuff to be successful in law school. And what they essentially did is they took Aboriginal students from all over Canada, brought them to Saskatoon, and did law school to them for eight weeks. And that's actually what it felt like. When I first started teaching in this program in the 80s, that's the model that we were using. And we basically brought students in, did law school to them for eight weeks, and at the end, we gave them an exam to see who could pass. And those were the ones that got to go on to law school. Um, it emphasized screening for admissions. Um, and we only ended up with 170 students being admitted to law school on the basis of that program in the period from 1973 to 1984. The success rates weren't good. Um, only 50 to 60 percent of the students who were admitted to law school that way um, graduated from law school with a law degree. <clears throat> and I saw that there were many capable students who either didn't complete the program in the summer successfully and weren't admitted to law school, or who went on to law school but didn't succeed in the law school atmosphere. So um, that seemed 
like a waste of all kinds of resources, the students' resources, our resources, the law school resources, and we looked at ways that we could revise the program. Um, so we looked at um, the problems with that model as being a focus on screening for the purposes of law school rather than a focus on preparation for the students. Um, law school tends to hide the ball and by that I mean um, often I think law lectures and law teachers value somebody who can catch on to the hidden meaning in something or um, can understand without being told directly. And um, that was a problem for the students in our program because they didn't have the same basis on which to guess the right answer as the other mainstream students had. It gave them a bit of head start in law school, but it only lasted for one term. And it was a really onerous program. We worked those students so hard. We gave them every class that was offered in law school. Um, we actually taught them more in eight weeks than they would have learned in law school in eight weeks. And just for the experience, we threw in some things that would never happen in the first eight weeks of law school, like we gave them um, the opportunity to do a moot court, which is a pretty stressful um, experience. So all of that in eight weeks was a very onerous program. So in order to try to improve our success rate, we moved on to a skills model. So what I thought was that there were really capable students who weren't succeeding, and that if we were able to actually tell them what they had to do to succeed in law school and not just concentrate on them figuring it out for themselves, they would do better. And um, if we focused on preparing the students to be successful in law school, rather than just seeing if they could be successful in law school, they would do better. We were still evaluating their readiness for law school because we are a national program. So we take students in from all over the country and we send students to law schools all over the country. So it's really important for us to be credible with the law schools and to send them students who are going to be able to succeed in their um, classes, but um, we do that more as a sideline now rather than our main emphasis. We reduced the number of courses that we were teaching and um, to provide room to teach the skills that students need to be successful in law school and we added customary law. The students who went through the first version of the program that was just doing law school to students kept saying, there's nothing relevant in this for me. There's nothing here that I recognize. This is just the um, oppressive legal system that has always oppressed us and you're making us be more assimilated in order to be successful. It's counterproductive. So we added a customary law component into the curriculum. We consulted with elders in the First Nations around Saskatoon about how we could add customary law. And um, they said it can't be something that the students are gonna be tested on. Because um, in the indigenous tradition, that's not how things are done. Students have to earn their knowledge in the traditional system and there are things that everybody can know and there are things that only certain people can know and they weren't going to breach any of their customary laws in order to have customary law taught to these students but um, they were willing to work with us to add a customary law component to the program and that made a huge difference. We found before we added a customary law component that students were going out there was such a strong need for contact with elders and people who were seen to be um, respectable authorities in their tradition that they, 
but they come from all over the country. So they would kind of go out and try to find an elder, and every once in a while they would find somebody who was passing himself off as an elder, but who wasn't really an elder, just because they were not from the area and didn't know. And um, so we stopped that. They didn't have to waste their time going out to look for elders, who may or may not be elders. And um, it made a component of the program relevant to them. And it, um, <clears throat> I think, is part of our improved success. When we did the skills model, in the very first year that we did it, our success rate went up to 79%. Before it was 50 to 60%, and um, it immediately shot up to 79%. So there wasn't a change in the students, you know, it wasn't some kind of gradual development. It was definitely the skills approach. And um, as we refined the skills approach, our success rate went up to 85%. So that's 85% of these students graduate with a law degree. And um, under this model, we had over 300 students enroll in law school. When you say skills, you're talking of language and communication and stuff like that? Or? We focus on the skills that you need to succeed in law school, which we um, sort of label as legal analysis synthesis, argument, and evaluation, um, writing skills, um, exam writing skills, study skills. I really found that students didn't have study skills um, because um, most of them are so alienated in the school system that they didn't, you know, they did the bare minimum to get by and they didn't um, really study. They just did what they had to do. All of us need a skills model. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. It's amazing the difference that it makes. Um, we still have, under this model, had a lower success rate than law students generally. In Canada, 95% of the students who enroll in law school graduate with a law degree. And most of the students who do not graduate choose to withdraw from law school. It's um, a very low withdrawal rate in law school. Um, it's still a very onerous course under this skills model. Um, the students didn't receive any recognition for the time and effort that they put into um, eight weeks of study. And um, the students had to give up an opportunity to work during the summer to attend this program. So in order to deal with those pro problems, we created a skills and credit model. So here, our emphasis is on um, preparing the students. Again, we retained that. Um, developing a more relevant curriculum for students and for law schools. So we um, added the customary law component to try to make the program more relevant to Indigenous students, but um, we didn't feel like the rest of the curriculum was relevant at all. It was basically contracts, criminal law, and torts, or um, criminal law, constitutional law, and some other first year subject. So um, we wanted to retain the ability to screen for law schools and to prepare students, um, but be more relevant to them and um, to retain the skills approach and we decided to do it by developing a property law curriculum. And the reason that we chose property law curriculum is that it's a really easy um, subject to introduce indigenous issues into it. So we can talk about aboriginal property rights, the rights to land. We can talk about cultural property in um, you know, not in terms of both um, physical cultural property like masks and drums and bundles and that kind of thing, and also um, cultural property in terms of knowledge about plants and that sort of thing, and also genetic issues because there's a huge um, mining of Aboriginal peoples for their genetic 
resources because they're seen as isolated populations that have unique genetic material. Um, there's a move to take their genetic resources and patent them. So there's a, an indigenous woman who says, first they came for our gold, then they came for our land, and now they're mining our bodies. And it's amazing. She's so right about um, her analysis of outsiders' views of indigenous people as having something of value all the time. We've retained customary law, even though we've made the curriculum more relevant to Aboriginal students. Um, we think that that's an, a really important uh, component, so we've retained that. And although I never wanted to be a politician or a salesperson, I went to every law school in Canada and talked to them about recognizing this program as equivalent to their property course so that our students could take a course credit into law school with them. And the hope was that by carrying a reduced course load, having already done property in the summer before they start law school, that they would be able to um, be more successful in law school. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. Our success rate is still 85%. Um, students do carry a reduced course load in first year law. Um, I think our students always found property law as the most difficult concept because one of the things that you have to do to understand Canadian property law is get your head around the idea that the foundation of property law is that the Queen owns everything and all that the rest of us get is just um, some rights that the Queen doesn't need right now. And of course, Indigenous people, above all, have difficulty with this concept because they know for sure that the land was always theirs before the Queen came along, and um, it's still theirs. And so getting rid of that property curriculum from uh, over the summer program during a supportive environment and um, with um, people who understand their point of view teaching them, it's, um, it's amazing how well they do. And actually, because personal property is so difficult, because we do that genetic material and cultural property and so on in the personal property component, and Aboriginal property is um, so difficult for students emotionally because they have to read Supreme Court cases where the Aboriginal people always lose and get their head around that. They actually think that this idea that the Queen owns all the land is actually kind of easy by comparison to those other things. So um, the... Uh, the um, property curriculum has been quite a success for us. The uh, skills that we work with in terms of uh, the um, legal analysis, synthesis, argument, and evaluation are easily transferable to the other law classes. And that's easy for me to say. I think students have a really hard time transferring those skills to other classes, but um, they are transferable to other classes and the students do feel like they have a head start that lasts for longer than the first eight weeks of law school or the first term of law school. And um, the customary law component of the program um, is as demanding as the uh, law school subjects are, but um, the um, students feel like they do have some grounding with the customary law, they, it acknowledges that they've had a legal tradition for thousands of years, rather than the stereotype of them being lawless and criminals and um, all sorts of negative stereotypes and that they were primitive and you know all of those negative things are really um, counteracted by having a customary law component in the curriculum. 
So as I said, the problems with it are that we haven't had a change in the success rate. We've had over 500 students admitted to law school on the basis of this curriculum. And um, I think that students are not going to be, um, have a success rate that's equivalent to other students because a lot of the reasons that they leave law school are not academic reasons. They're, if you look at Statistics Canada information, Aboriginal people have the lowest um, income. They have really poor health indicators. They have really high levels of social problems. Um, the students are likely to have relatives who commit suicide. They're likely to have relatives who are in prison. And um, all of those things make it more difficult for them to study than mainstream middle class students who don't have those problems. So I don't know if there's anything that we can do in terms of academic support and designing a program that is going to improve the success rate beyond where we are now. Um, it's still a very onerous course. At the end, every year, students tell me it's the most difficult things that, thing that they've ever done in their lives, but they're really proud of themselves for finishing it and they say it's the best thing that they've ever done in their lives. So um, I think the fact that it's onerous is maybe not a problem. That probably shouldn't be on the problem slide. Um, students still miss opportunities to work in the summer and to um, gain work experience to save money to go to school in the fall. So that is a problem because they come from the poorest um, people in the country, so um, that's something that we're working to try to deal with in terms of getting more money for scholarships and bursaries and so on for students who come from our program. So I think that our experience um, tells us that we can't just do affirmative action and hope for the best, which is sort of what we were doing on under that first law school model, which was very much designed with the law schools in, in mind. We wanted to be doing something that the law schools could recognize as identical to what they do and tell them that this student succeeded in something that's identical to what you do, so therefore they can succeed in your program. And I don't think that's the way to de design an effective program. That's an easy program, and it's an easy sell to law schools, but it wasn't good for law students, for Aboriginal law students. So. Um, we really took seriously the need to monitor student success and follow them to see if they graduated. Um, we adjusted the program because the student success rate wasn't appropriate. 50%, 60% wasn't good enough. And um, we had to examine the program, not just the students. I think it was easy for people to say, oh well, um, if you buy into the stereotype of Aboriginal people as not intelligent and so on, um, you can say, well, 50% is good because that's 50% more than would have gotten into law school otherwise. But um, you need to examine the program and see where change is needed and how you can make it better so that more students can be successful we can't buy into the racism that's already a barrier to success for Aboriginal students. Um, one of the things that is a barrier to the success of the program is the sphere of influence for the program. Um, <coughs> we can't change the law school curriculum. We can only change our own curriculum. And um, the Law schools aren't likely to change their program unless they see how it can be done. And by including more Aboriginal topics and Aboriginal issues as ways to teach standard law school curriculum in property, I think we actually have influenced what's taught in law schools to some extent. We do have a practice of bringing in professors from law schools across the country to teach with us. And um, lots of them have said that it's a life-changing experience for them to be in a program where Aboriginal people actually speak because Aboriginal students are notoriously quiet in the classroom 
when they're the minority, but where they're all Aboriginal students in the classroom, they speak freely and debate and um, show the professors what they're really capable of, and that's quite exciting for the professors who come and teach with us. Um, so by doing these things, we've kind of increased our sphere of influence, and we haven't um, been content to just say that we can only do things within our own program, because you can lead by example, and um, that's one of the things that we've done. Um, as I said, the circumstances of Aboriginal people as among the poorest and um, having high levels of social pro problems and so on is uh, a problem for their success. And um, another barrier to our success recently has been um, the increasing difficulty of monitoring student success. Um, there's a big emphasis on privacy now. And um, with uh, privacy, the um, institutions can kind of hide behind the students' privacy rights to not tell us that Aboriginal students are not doing well in their institution. So um, there's, um, I don't know what you call it here, but um, in uh, the Aboriginal community in Canada, they call it the Moxon Telegraph. Um, it's, you know, like the grapevine or something, you always hear, eventually, what's really going on. So the schools that have uh, told me they can't give me the student results because of privacy concerns, I eventually find out that um, their Aboriginal students aren't doing well, and it's not the, the students' privacy that they're protecting, it's their institutional failure that they're protecting. So that's an interesting thing. And maybe I should have had the video off for that. <laughs> um, so racism is um, a problem in Canadian society. That's why Aboriginal people are at um, the place that they're at. I think one of the things that we need to recognize is that um, Aboriginal students internalize racism. And um, there's a lot of work that's been done by psychologists in the United States on stereotype threat. And um, anybody who is um, going to see themselves as less than in a particular situation um, is going to perform worse because of what the psychologists call stereotype threat. And I think that that's something that law schools have to work on um, to do as much as they can to eradicate racism in the context of law school, be because I know that students feel the effects of it. Um, so I've talked about our sphere of influence. I've talked about Aboriginal people's um, social indicators and so on. Um, and I've talked about monitoring difficulties, but all of those things can um, have an effect on what we do and on the um, success of students. So we made an effort to look at what does success depend on for students and for this program, and one of the things that we learned from the elders that we worked with to develop the um, customary law component of the program is that teaching the whole student is important. So First Nations culture um, says that there are four aspects to a human being. The mind, the body, the heart and the soul, or the intellectual, physical, emotional and spiritual, and that you have to teach the whole person if you're going to um, be successful. So we actually make an effort to do that. And um, we're kind of a model for these kinds of programs um, for various places. We had a visitor from Australia who said, how do you stop your program from being a checkup from the neck up? And I just love that expression because we do actually spend a lot of time on people's heads and uh, not very much else. And um, so, but it's hard when you're dealing with a subject like law to 
do anything about the other aspects of people beyond the intellectual. Um, I feed people. That's what I do when I want to deal with the physical aspect of the human being. I make sure to feed the students at least once a week. It's not the kind of program where the students pay fees that include their meals, but um, I make an effort to feed them at least once a week for some kind of event and to do something social. Um, we recognize the emotional impact of the legal system on students who are Aboriginal. So we are aware of the emotional impact of the law. And the customary law program, uh, because Aboriginal law is part of a system that is integrated. It's not, you can't sort of divide out this, the spiritual from the legal, from the social. It's all integrated. So when they're studying customary law, they have to have an acknowledgement of spirit at some level. And so that's how we deal with um, that. And I think that it has been um, an important part of the success of the revised program. It also dis depends on explicit instruction in the skills. And um, law school instruction is never explicit in Canada. I don't know what law school is like here, but in Canada, it's not explicit at all. It's very kind of hide the ball, um, tell me what I'm thinking kind of guesswork. And um, we're very explicit about the skills that students need to be successful. We're also very explicit about the values that are at work in the legal system because they're different from the values that um, would be dominant in Aboriginal communities. So in the legal system, for example, we value objectivity. So you're not supposed to be the judge if you know the people who are involved. And in an Aboriginal community, it's exactly the opposite. If you don't know me and you don't know what I'm about and you don't know what my life's been like, who are you to pass judgment on me and to say what is going to fix me or change me or be the best for me? So it's exactly the opposite. So we have to very explicitly talk about the values that are underlying the legal system. And I think for the mainstream students, that's something that you don't have to do because they live in a society and a culture where they understand all these values because they're shared values in sort of the immigrant society. Um, skills training includes, as I've already said, legal analysis, synthesis, argument, evaluation, legal writing, study skills, exam writing skills, and um, coping skills. Law school is stressful, and our program is very stressful. It's a high stakes program for the students who take it because they're admitted on a conditional basis. The condition of their admission is that they successfully complete our program. So um, it's a very high stakes <coughs> program, and they engage in a lot of, you know, the world will end if I fail sort of thinking which is very counterproductive. And so we actually explicitly talk again about how do you cope with that kind of situation, that kind of stress, and how do you keep yourself healthy. And every once in a while I have a student who comes to me and says, I want to drop out. And I always sort of interrogate the students a little bit before I agree to let them drop out. Why do you want to drop out? Are you just scared? Um, because the world won't end if you fail. All that will happen if you fail is that you fail. And then maybe you'll have to do it over again. And what's the worst that can happen? So stay, so stay here. But some of them say, I can't imagine doing this for the next three years, let alone the rest of my life. I think you people who have law degrees all must be crazy because I don't know why you want to torture yourself this way. Then I say, okay, maybe it is best that you go. But uh, we don't let people go just because they're scared. If they think we're all crazy and they don't want to do this for the rest of their lives, that's okay. But hardly any of them ever drop out. We have very few students who drop out. Um, 
Lots of them say they're scared and want to drop out, but we hang on to them and they, they stick with it. <laughs>